Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Throwback Thursday. We're in black and white today. No, it's <coughs> good to see you all tonight and glad you're with us. Hope you have a ready, uh, you're ready to study God's Word. Here's how you can reach me, uh, 276-340-2653. A word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me. And, and if you're in the area of uh, Eden, 250 the Boulevard is where we meet. Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, Sunday, uh, Thursday night at 7 p.m. for uh, Bible study as well. And so if you're in the area, we hope that you will come out and join us and uh, study God's Word with us. We'll be glad to see you and hope that you will take advantage of that very thing. I appreciate what uh, Michael was talking about, about the church. And interestingly enough, that's what we're going to be discussing, uh, something along the line about what God expects from the church and what God wants uh, the church to look like. You know, one of the things that we are always talking about, friends, is how to identify the New Testament church. The idea that you can know if the church you're in is in the Bible or not is by going to the Bible and seeing if it's described, the church you're in is described uh, identically to what, uh, what, what you're doing. In other words, if you're practicing something that's totally different from the Bible, foreign to the Bible, then you can know for sure that the church you're in is not in the Bible. If you can't find its name, practice, origin, whatever in the Bible, then you, you should be uh, then saying to yourself, this is not the Lord's church. This is not the New Testament church. And so uh, we, are, we are constantly wanting people to go back and examine the Bible. Don't take our word for it, but simply examine the truth to see if the church you're in is the church in the Bible. Now, <clears throat> what about the church that's in the Bible? What does, what does it look like? What is God's plan for the church. You know, a lot of times individuals will come along and they'll have this idea about what the church is supposed to be like and they'll start adding their own uh, things to it, bells and whistles and frills and whatever. And they change what the Bible says, they change the Lord's church into something that is totally foreign. It becomes a church of man or it becomes a church that a man established so that he can be different, have his own name or bring honor and glory to himself. But God had a plan for the church. The church was in God's mind before the world even began. Now, I don't know if Michael covered this or not, but if you'll notice, if you'll notice that when we're talking about the church, there is something eternal about it. In Ephesians 3 and verse 10, to the intent that now to the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God had this plan for the church for the beginning of time. And one of the things that God had planned for the church was how it was going to be conducted. The individuals that were going to be in the church as leaders were going to look like a certain thing. And so God always intended for the church in its fullness and complete form, to have elders in it. Now notice this, in Acts 14, 23, the Bible says, When they had ordained them elders in every church, they had prayed with fasting, they commended themselves to the Lord on whom they believed. So elders, elders, God wanted elders in the church. As a matter of fact, if you look at Titus 1 and verse 5, listen to what Paul says. Paul says, For this cause left I thee, that's Titus, I left you in Crete, that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting to ordain elders in every city <clears throat> as I had appointed thee. So here we're finding the kind of men or what God had, in, had planned for the church once it was in existence. Now these elders, these words elders, is the word presbyteros. All right? It's the word presbyteros. These are, if you have your Strong's Concordance, this is the Strong's number, 4245, 4244. The presbyteron is a collection or a group of elders. The eldership, you might say. Now, you can see where some of these words sound very much like words that you see in religious circles today. The Presbyterians. Presbyterian church claims they have elders. All right, well, they're using a, a term or they're using a facet of the, the New Testament church to try to identify their particular brand of church. Now, 
just because the Presbyterian church has presbyters or presbytery or elders in it, that doesn't mean that they're the New Testament church. They're just using a term that, is, that you find in the Bible. But God intended for the church to have these elders or pres, presbytery or pres, uh, uh, presbyteros, presbyterion. Uh, elders is what they are. And when you're looking at the Bible, there's a number of other terms that you need to understand. Elders, bishops, pastors, uh, presbyters, they're, they're all the same. They're all talking about the same office, same person, same individuals. Now notice in Ephesians 4 verse 11, and he gave some to the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some, and here's the word, pastors. Some pastors and teachers. Now, there's an interesting fact about this word pastor. It's only found one time in the Bible. The word itself is not found one time. It's actually found a whole lot of places. But it's translated pastor in only one place. And that's Ephesians 4.11. Everywhere else is the word poimen, and it actually means shepherd. All right? Someone who cares for a flock is what we're talking about here. And so everywhere else you see this word, it's translated shepherd. And so when you're talking about an elder, or you're talking about a pastor, you're talking about a shepherd, someone who shepherds the flock. All right? So you understand these words, you start to understand the kind of individuals that God wanted in the church. All right, now let's look at it again. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 4, the elders, now notice, here's that word elders, which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder. So Peter says, I'm an elder. I'm, one, I'm an elder in the Lord's church as well. And so I'm exhorting you other elders. Here's what you do. You feed the flock of God. Now, that word feed the flock, or that phrase feed the flock, has to do with shepherding. It's the word pastor. All right, so feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall... You shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now, notice what Paul, what Peter is saying here. He's using terms that all have to do with the office of an elder. And he's using terms like feed the flock, which refers to shepherd. Or here's a word, this word oversight. This word oversight. <clears throat> now, notice this. Oversight <coughs> is the word episkopos. And it is translated bishop. It means an overseer, someone who oversees. So let's go back and look at what Peter said. Peter said to the elders, Elders, you need to shepherd or pastor because God has given you oversight. He's given you to be bishops. Now, again, when you look at that word, episkopos, it sounds like Again, it sounds like a denominational term, the Episcopalian Church. Well, again, just because a group of individuals claim to be Episcopalian, that is, they claim to have overseers, does not make the Lord's Church. They're just using a term that they found in the Bible. But when you're looking at the New Testament Church, there is a way, there is a, a, a manner in which these men have to conduct themselves in order to be proper overseers in the Lord's church. Now listen to what Paul said. Paul said in Acts 20 and verse 28, he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Now again we have an apostle that's using a number of different words that describe different functions of the same office, that is elders. So what does Paul say? Paul says, take heed unto yourselves and to the flock. Well, they must be shepherds or something. Over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, <coughs> all right, bishops, to feed the church of God. There's, that, there's a shepherd again. They're, they're feeding the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And so the church that Christ purchased with his own blood has individuals that have to take some responsibility in this area. 
They're to feed the flock. They're to, to watch. They're to oversee the flock. To feed it. And it's the same term as bishop. Now, who did Paul call bishops? Who did Paul say was to be overseers? If we back up to Acts chapter 20 and verse 17, Acts chapter 20 and verse 17, listen to what he says. The Bible says, And from Miletus he sent unto Ephesus and called the elders of the church. So Paul <coughs> sends for the elders of the church at Ephesus. The elders in the church at Ephesus, and he says to them, Take heed to yourselves, elders, and to the flock which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. So he tells the elders, Elders, God has made you bishops, and your job is to pastor or feed or shepherd the flock. That sounds like what, what Peter said. Peter said to the elders that they are to take the oversight and they are to feed. Elders, you are to shepherd or pastor the flock because God has made you bishops. See how that works? And so we're talking about different characteristics of the same office. Bishops, elders, pastors, they're all talking about the same office, the same, the same function. And this is what, what God had intended. So we have the elders being called overseers or bishops. And they're being told that they should do the job of a shepherd or pastor. Now, when we put this back in Titus 1 and verse 5, now listen to this. For this cause, Paul says to, to Titus, I left thee a Crete that thou shouldest set in order things that are wanting and ordain elders, bishops, pastors in every city as I had appointed thee. And then he starts giving some qualifications for these men. He says, for a bishop. So the bishops, elders, pastors, uh, overseers, they're, they're talking about the same office, the same person. I find it very interesting. I always laugh whenever I see a sign. I pull up to a denominational church building. They have a sign out here for the, the pastor. You know, his, his chief spark parking spot. And it says, you know, pastor parking, elder, bishop, some, some, something, 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 you know, pastor. What is that, redundant? I mean, we're saying, I mean, that's just a repetitive, repetitive, repetitive term, right? Saying the same thing over and over. Elder, bishop, pastor. Elder, bishop is the pastor. Well, what about, the, what about the pastor so-and-so being the elder bishop? Or maybe he's the bishop so-and-so and he's the elder pastor. Or maybe elder so-and-so is the passionate bister, bishop. I don't know. Let's just mix up the words. Definition don't mean anything today, as I recall. But Paul is saying the same thing. He's talking about these individuals who have a certain function. To feed, to oversee, to shepherd. Now, notice what the Bible says. The Bible, when it talks about elders, it always talks about more than one being in the church. God intended for the church to have more than one elder uh, conducting the function of overseeing and feeding the flock. Notice how the praise is used. Ordain elders in every city. Acts 14, 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church. And again, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 1, The elders which are among you I exhort, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Do you ever stop and think that when you walk into your church and you talk about the pastor or even the senior pastor, that that's really not how God designed it. God didn't talk about senior pastors. He didn't talk about a pastor in the church or a senior pastor. He had men in mind. He had in mind certain men in certain positions doing certain things to care for the, the governing of the church. Now, elders in every church. Now, someone says, well, James... 
uh, what are the what's the job of these elders? You know, do they have uh, all authority? Well, let's look what God says about this in Hebrews thirteen verse seven. The writer says, "Remember them which have the rule over you." Now that's the elders. The elders oversee the flock. They have they have rule. They have a governance. They have the ability to govern or to rule. Obey them which have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls. Who's that? We're talking about the elders. The elders watch for your soul. They shepherd the flock. They oversee the flock. They're watching. As they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. And so the Bible says, yes, there, there is some uh, authority given them. They have responsibilities. They're shepherding the flock. If you had a if you had a shepherd watching your literal flock, your 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 sheep out here, or maybe you had a, a foreman on your ranch that's, that's taking care of your animals, you would expect them to carry on a certain function. If there's a sick animal, you'd expect them to go take care of it. If there was one missing, you'd expect them to go look for it. You expect them to feed it, feed the animals, feed the flock. Feed the herd. So it is with God's flock. God expected his elders, his bishops, his pastors and shepherds to feed the flock and watch over them, care for them, and watch out for the dangers that would come in because that's exactly what uh, Paul said. If we go back and look at Acts 20, in verse 28, when he says, Take heed to yourselves and to the flock, why does he say, Take heed to yourselves and take heed to the flock? He said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves. So look, here's two dangers. One, there's going to come someone from the outside, or there's going to be a danger from the outside coming in. Wolves that are going to come in and hurt the flock. But also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul knows there's dangers involved in shepherding the flock, and it could come from your own self. That's why a shepherd has to look internally as well as externally. He has to look at himself as well as all the flock to make sure that everything is the way God intended for it. Now, you might say, well, we, every church needs shepherds. Every church needs elders. Well, they do. But you know what? God knows that not just anybody is going to be suitable for this job. And so in God's plan for the church to have elders, He wanted men to have certain qualifications. Now this is really where, this is really where it gets kind of hairy. Because oftentimes what you find in the churches of men, you find them say, well, we're going to have a pastor. We need to have a pastor. We've got a senior pastor and a junior pastor and a, and a sophomore pastor and a freshman pastor, I guess. We've got a pastor of music and a pastor of education. We've got a, a pastor of women and we've got this kind of pastor, that kind of pastor, here a pastor, there a pastor, everywhere a pastor, pastor. Well, is that really what God intended? Did God intend for there to be women pastors? Junior pastors, senior pastors, is that what God intended? Let's look at this. In Titus 3, in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 7. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 7. Now, uh, excuse me, 1 Timothy 3 verse 1. There's a reason why, there's a reason why God specified. It's because God knows that not just anybody is going to be suitable for this job. Now, friends, we understand that concept when it comes, when it comes to the world. We know that not everybody's going to be suited for every job that comes down the pike, right? Everybody's not going to be suited to be a mechanic. Everybody's not going to be suited to be a brain surgeon. Listen, if I have to have surgery, I don't want just anybody walking in and going, well, I think I can do that. I'm, you know, I'm, going, to take a, I'm going to take a stab at it. No, you ain't going to stab at me, you know. I want someone who's qualified, who knows what they're doing. And so God said... The office of a pastor, bishop, elder is so important, I want certain people in that position. And here's what he says. This is a true saying. If a man, well, that right there eliminates all the women. I'm sorry. I didn't write the book. You know, I didn't write the book. I'm just reading it. 
if a man desire the office of a bishop, or elder, or pastor, or shepherd, or presbyter, or episcopos, if a man desires the office, he desires the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Again, I'm sorry. That eliminates the women. You can't have women pastors because, you, because they can't be the husband of one wife. They must be vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given hospitality, apt to teach, not given, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest, any, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have good report of them which are without, that is those outside the church, lest he fall into reproach and snare of the devil. Now, that's what Paul writes to Timothy. Remember, Timothy is supposed to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So his job, too, would be to set in order by establishing elders if needed be, but certainly to make sure that men are qualified to fill the role of an elder. Now, here's what Paul writes to Titus. Now, we're going to make some uh, application here in just a moment to all this, but I want you to know what Paul writes to Titus. Titus chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 5. All right, Titus 1, in verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that I should have set in order the things that are wanting, and ordained elders in every city as I had appointed thee. What are they going to be like, Paul? If any be blameless, the husband of one wife. Again, he's telling, he's telling the church at Crete the same thing that he told the church in, uh, let's see, where was Timothy? Uh, Ephesus, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, same thing in Ephesus, same thing in Crete. Now, we're talking about a long way apart. Ephesus on the mainland, Crete is actually an island. So, they're getting the same instruction. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, again, sorry women, you cannot be a pastor, bishop, elder, shepherd, all right, presbyter, you just can't be that. Having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Now, here is an elder's job, to watch out for those individuals that would come in and teach things contrary to the faithful word. He ought to be able to answer them. And so all of these, all these qualifications, go to uh, making a man that is in... He's, 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 he's God's man. He's God's man. He's, he's shepherding God's flock. He's looking out for God's people. Now, friends, the reason why we say all this is because God loves the church so much that He wanted people, qualified people, in this position. He didn't want just any Tom, Dick, or Harry up here. He didn't want a Sally and a Susie either. He wanted certain men to be elders. Why? Because there are dangers, there are dangers in having men in a position who aren't qualified. Why would God not want just one man? Why would he always say ordain elders in every church? Why would he not want one man being in a position? Here's why. Because friends, if there is a one man, if there's one man in a position, do you think he might get the big head? Do you, might, do you think he might take all this power to himself? Remember, pride was a problem. Paul actually said in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 6, he said he warned about not being a novice, right? Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So with this job, there's going to be a danger 
of saying, well, you know what? I, I've got some rule. I've got some authority. I've got some power. Now, is that the kind of person God wants in the church? No. Is that the kind of person you want, you would want over you? I would hope not. See, God knows that one man rule is dangerous. If one man has all the power, you better watch out. You better watch out because he will use that power. Men love power. I think they love power more than they love money. Because they can ex they love to force their will. That's why, again, Paul said, not being self-willed. All right? These men aren't the kind of individuals that say, well, we're going to do this because we want to. God doesn't want that kind of individual in, in, the, in the church. And so he knows it's dangerous. That's why he said elders. That's why he said elders. Uh, I want you to consider this. Paul knew that if, you, if you're in a position of authority and power, it can go to your head. It can get you in trouble. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, did I get that right? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to start in verse 18. Paul has been taking up this collection of money to take back to Jerusalem. And Paul did not want to be the only man responsible for this sum of money. Now, I know there's a lot of so-called pastors today, boy, they love to give their hands on money, and they don't want anybody else's hands in it. You know, don't be counting their money. Don't be fingering their money, their love offerings or whatever. Paul said, look, I don't want this. He says, we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all churches. Now, what's happened here? All right. Paul is talking about Titus. All right. Put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed, he accepted exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. So here's two individuals that were selected to travel, and Paul said, everybody knows these people. Everybody has given these, these folks have good report. All right? These are the men that are traveling. He says, and not that only, but also who was chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace. That's the, that's the offering. He said, the churches, all the brethren, chose these people to travel with us with this grace, with this great collection, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. Why would Paul want people with him and why would he want people that have been chosen <clears throat> by the churches to be involved in this? He said, avoiding this, this is what I want to avoid, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. See this? Paul said, I don't want someone to come up and say, well, Paul took some of that money. Oh, no. Oh, no. Paul said, we ain't having that. We're going to make sure that everybody is accountable to someone else and that no one is able to be accused of taking anything that has been given to our trust. We want to provide for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of all men. See that? So we want to make sure that no one can, can accuse us, false accuse us. Now, if you've got one-man rule, if you've got a one-man rule, who's, who's going to check him? Who's going to make sure that he's, he's uh, on the up and up? Who's going to make sure that he is not taking liberties where he shouldn't take liberties? Who's responsible for him? Well, no one with a one-man rule. Here he is taking the authority and saying, I am the pastor. God never said it. God never said that. God's intention was for 
qualified men to be pastors, elders, bishops, overseers, shepherds in the church so that the church would run and operate the way God intended. Now, I want you to compare what we have quickly learned about pastors, elders, bishops, shepherds, overseers, presbyters, all the same thing. I want you to listen and I want you to remember what we've just learned about this. As we consider pastors in the churches today. Now, one I started off by saying there's a way you can know whether the church you're in is the church that you read about in the Bible. And one way you can notice, friends, is you can see if the pastors in these churches of men, if they look and act and operate anything like what God said they should act like. Now I want you to consider, I want you to consider some of these pastors. And we're just going to go back and we're going to consider what God says. This is Mr. Ronnie Andrews, River, Riverview Baptist Church. Let's look how he operates. Uh-oh, I think I just... Uh, don't tell me now these are going to work now. That'd be the way it goes. Oh, there's the problem. Got a, got a plug and unplug. I don't know if this is going to work now. <clears throat> Give it time to fire up. Let's see if it work now. Might not. Why? When they did. Why? What? What would have happened? Because Steve is a Vietnam veteran. He laid out in the. Uh, Swamp for uh, two or three days at a time, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And what does that mean? It means that this, your guys could have got killed if he would have gotten there. Even oh. he is a preacher. Oh. All right, now this is, the caller's talking about the preacher at the Glen Hill Baptist Church. Micah and, and Mark had gone over there. And he said, well, they could have, he could have killed them. They're lucky, they're lucky to get out of there alive. Now, friends, my, my, here's my, my question. Here's. Steve, the pastor, Vietnam vet, he's laying out here in the mud and the marsh and gone without food, and man, he could have just killed him if he'd got mad. Well, now, is that what a pastor should look like, should act like? I mean, didn't we just read? Didn't we just read? Uh, uh, not a brawler? Didn't we, didn't we read that? Didn't we read not a, uh, a, a, a fighter or unruly? Look at this, Titus chapter 1. Let's look at verse 6 here. Not accused of riot or really. Here's a man that calls in and accuses him. Man, he's ready to fight. He's ready to rumble. Is that really? Not a striker? Not soon angry? Oh, but the pastor of Glen Hill, boy, he, 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 you lucky to get out of there alive. He's just a walking time bomb. You know? He could snap at any minute. Friends, I don't know about you. I'd be scared if that was if I was in a if I was in the church, if I was in the Glen Hill Baptist Church and that was and that was my pattern, man, I'd be afraid to talk to that guy. If you're in the flock and you misbehave, boy, you talk about he might just snap. He he might kill you too. See what we're talking about, friends? This is why God specified qualifications. Now is that the kind of man that should be a pastor? Well, let's just uh, uh, aside the fact that he's not he's in a church that's not even in the Bible. But to say that, man, he could just, he could just kill you in a moment's notice? Really? 
you lucky to be out there alive? I don't know if that's the kind of pastor that, that God had in mind. I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Now let's go back to uh, this one. Let's see if it'll play now. We able to ask questions now? No, sir. I've told you once to get out of our property. Now I'm going to call the cops and get you off of my property. Well, you actually said Wednesday evening that we could come no, back sir. and ask questions on Sunday Bible See class. You. I'll let you go. So is this how a servant of the Lord is supposed to act, sir? You can call it what you want to, but if you don't get off our properties, I will have you arrested. That's my last warning. Are you really going to act like this in front of your members, sir? All right, sir. I'll go call the police right there. If you show back up again, you will be dismissed. You can leave one or two ways. You can leave peacefully, or you can leave by the cops. Is that simple? All right. Don't come back on this property again. None of you. All right, I'll just calling to see if you're going to change your ways with the way you're acting. That's fine. You let me be the worry about ways. You worry about your ways. Okay. Get off the property. And if I see you on here again, I promise you, the police will be called and we will have a dispute. You do not come into a service and mess up a religious thing. Whether you believe the way I believe or not, I don't care. Videotape me. I run the devil out of our church. So get out. Don't come on this property again. Understand me. All right, well, as I, leave, right. as I leave, I hope you read 2 Timothy 2.24. I hope you read too, son. You worry about your own problems. You get out of my business. All right, now, let's go back to, let's go back to these qualifications. No riot? Unruly? No, that, that, that can't be a pastor. Surely not, you know, aside from the fact that he's the pastor See, he automatically not qualified there, but he is right, not soon angry. Boy, you talk about angry. What about, what about temperate? Didn't we read that as well? Titus uh, chapter 1, verse 8. A lover of, lover of hospitality. Here's temperate right here. That means self-controlled. Uh, a lover of hospitality. I don't know about you. You know, this word actually means... You know, you welcome welcome strangers. It's it's love of strangers. It's philo xenos. Xeno is strange, and philos or philo is love. Love strangers. And here's a man who goes, get out, get out, don't come back. Even though he said you could ask questions later. No, we're not going. Well, now let's, we need to bring up apt to teach. I guess. I thought you were supposed to teach people. I thought you were, your, your job was to teach or educate. See that? Now, now friends, we're talking, about, we're talking about pastors. We're talking about the pastors in your churches. And all I'm saying is, do they even look, does they even look like the church you read about in the Bible? Let me tell you, if this man... If this man was a pastor in the Lord's church, well, he wouldn't be. He wouldn't be. He, he's, not, he's not even remotely qualified to be a pastor. Not with behavior like that. Now, let's look again. Let's look at another one. This is uh, Calvin Adams, Grace Baptist Church in Eden. And uh, listen to what he says. Hey, hey, how you doing? What's that? That's not flying by a church, church. and invite people to come down. Be with us down here on the boulevard. 250 the boulevard. Well, if I found any of mine coming down out when they're supposed to be here, I'd shoot them. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're a pastor. I am a pastor. Well, if I found any of mine coming down out when they're supposed to be here, I'd shoot them. Mm -hmm. I am a pastor. Yeah, I'd shoot them. Yeah, I'd shoot them. All right. If he found anybody coming down to study the Bible with us when they were supposed to be in his church, he'd shoot them. Let me think about this again. Again, we've got temperate issues, right? We've got anger issues, not soon angry. We've got shepherding the flock, caring for the flock. I don't know about you, friends, but if I had somebody watching my flock and he started shooting them, boy, he'd be fired. What do you mean shooting my animals here? He's supposed to be caring for them. He loved them so much he's going to put a bullet in them. He's going to shoot them. 
Now, really, friends, is that, is that, is that a pastor? When, I, when we went down on this occasion, uh, on another occasion we went down, we were actually invited by the, the preacher, the evangelist that was holding a meeting for Calvin Adams. And we went down there, and he wouldn't even ask a question. He said, you teach another gospel. You're welcome to come in, but you need to be respectful. Stand up when we sing, but you're welcome to leave. Don't come back. Well, which is it? Can we, can we come or can we leave? We just came to ask a question. No, we're not going to ask a question. Well, let's talk about this for a minute. What about this? What about Titus 1 and verse 9? Here's what a pastor should be doing. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. He wouldn't even want to talk to us. He wouldn't even ask a question. He wouldn't even let us ask a question. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. If that's who we were, he said, I taught another gospel. He said, oh, you taught another gospel. I said, what was it? He said, you believe, he said, I said, well, what is the gospel I'm supposed to be teaching? Jesus Christ uh, died on the cross for our sins. I said, I believe that. He rose again on the third day. I said, I believe that. He said, you believe that you have to be a member of the church of Christ to be saved? I said, I, I believe that too. It's in the Bible. So that's another doctrine. Well, why don't you convince us? Why don't you stop our mouths? See, a pastor could do that. And by the way, let's just take notice. Uh, let's just put all the elders in the, in the Lord's church on notice here. Brethren, if you, if you can't stop the mouths of the gainsayers, if you can't answer false doctrine, you need to check whether you're meeting the qualifications too. You need to be able to stop the mouths and convince the gainsayers. Stop the unruly and vain talkers. It's not, the, it's not the preacher's job to do that. It's your job to do it. Now, we can criticize the dom denominational preachers because they don't do it. But let's stop and think, you know what? Elders in the Lord's church, the real church, the church you read about in the book, they have an obligation too. These are talking right to you. So, stop the miles. But here's Calvin Adams. He, he's going to shoot his members and, and not let anybody ask questions. What's up with that? Is that really pastor material? What about this? What about this? Listen to what this preacher says. He's going to talk about tithing. Now, let me show you something here. Hebrews chapter 7. Now, again, I'm just sharing this for your own good. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment. In other words, if they did not take tithes from the people, they were disobeying God. Now, if this is a better covenant, if priests, ministers of the gospel, do not receive from the people they're ministering to, they are disobeying God. Now, you get that? He said the Levites had a command to take tithes from the people. Therefore, if preachers today don't take tithes from the people, they're disobeying God. Really? I said, let's see, didn't we have a qualification of an elder? Oh, I know. Yeah. Wasn't it something about filthy lucre? Right? Uh, I believe in 1 Timothy chapter 3, I believe uh, Paul said, uh, let's see here, 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, Paul said that he is not greedy of filthy lucre. And uh, isn't is that uh, wouldn't that be the about what we're talking about here? Lover of covetous, not covetous, not greedy of filthy lucre. Here's a man going, yeah, we don't take tithes. We're disobeying God. Yeah, you got to take that tithe. Friends, God never commanded tithes in the New Testament. It's a better covenant. How about this? How about? Give as you've been prospered, as you purpose in your heart, 1 Corinthians 16, 
2 Corinthians 9, 7. Now, this kind of pastor, this is the kind of pastor that's going direct opposite of what God said about pastors in the New Testament. So, is he, is he meeting the qualifications? You see the problem we're having here? God wants certain kind of men, and this is what, this is what the world gets. Let's look at one more. Now listen to this caller. This caller calls in, and he says he's a pastor, but he has a problem with tithing. And listen to the admonition, maybe rebuke, that he gets from the other quote-unquote pastors. And uh, my question is about tithing. I believe in tithing. I, I believe the laborer is worthy of his hire. But I have a real big burden on my heart. I, I've been watching this show a long time. I hear a lot of struggling people calling in saying that uh, they can't afford to tithe. It's damaging their marriage. Uh, all of these real sad stories. And, and I'm a minister. Uh, I spend a lot, a lot, a lot of tithing money, a lot of my own money, helping these poor people who can't help themselves. I, like I said, I do believe in tithing, but I also believe in mercy, uh, and I, I, I believe that when we, we should do our best, that when we find we can't, I believe God will forgive us our debts, but I also, you know... We, we, um, need, we need, sir, thank you so much for calling, but I need you to synthesize your question. And I just want to know. I, I just want to know if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong when I when I I don't take tithes from from some of these real poor people in my flock. Mm. Praise the Lord. Mm. Uh, Matthew ten eight. Mm. And I guess the companion question is that: Is he wrong when he doesn't take tithes or extract tithes? from poor people in his congregation. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Mount. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, Gage, uh, let, me, let me address this. Um, Gage, it says there in the third chapter of Malachi for uh, the people to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. You, you see, we understand that tithing is a thing of faith. Okay, where you don't have the money and you don't quite understand where it's going to come from, but you know you're going to trust God and give him a tenth of the little that you have. It is a thing of faith. And let me say, uh, those people who are, who are dirt poor and trying to tithe, um, they are working to exercise their faith and they're, they're leaning on the promises of, of God, hoping for God's blessing. And uh, don't deprive them of that. Don't cheat them out of that. So, those dirt, those dirt poor folks, you need to make sure you get their 10%. Now, here, you see what I'm saying? The man's calling in going, you know what, I feel bad because I know they're, you know, they're on limited incomes. They have very, very uh, small amount of disposable income or they're hurting here and there and different things troubling them. And Oh, no, no, you make sure, you know, make sure they give their 10%. Hey friends, now is that is that covetous? Especially when the Bible says, "Give as you've been prospered, give cheerfully." <coughs> now, these are the kind of pastors that that are in the church of men, and who who made these men rulers? You know, it reminds me of, of Acts seven twenty seven, when uh, uh, Stephen is talking about Moses. And what did they say to Moses? What did his, his brethren say about Moses? Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Who, who, who put you in charge? Who put you in charge? Verse 35, they said, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Who, who is that? Who put you in charge? You know what? I'm going to tell you, friends. You know who put these men in charge? You know who put these uh, riotous, covetous, greedy, uh, afraid to answer, quarrelsome, hateful men in charge. You know who put them in charge? You did. You put them in charge. You put them where they, where they are. You actually said, I'm going to let somebody be one pastor, one man, and have all the rule over me, and let him do what he wants to, tell me what to do, and I'm going to do it. If he tells me I've got to give a love offering and a charity offering and a free will offering and a tithe offering, I'm going to do it. You know why? 
You know why? Because you haven't checked out the Bible. You haven't examined what the Bible said, and therefore you vote these guys in to be a dictator, really, over you. Here's Randy Linderman, formerly of Druid Hills Baptist Church in Martinsville. You did mention Druid Hills Baptist Church. I was invited up there at the end of August, so I've only been there, uh, voted in as, as pastor there, uh, about a month. All right, so he was voted in as pastor. Voted in as pastor. Here's a lady called in, and she's going to talk about Brian Edwards. All right, here on What's the Bible Say? I go along with Brian Edwards because Brian is a true Christian man. He preaches the Bible. His church is a spirit-filled church. His church. And you I go right. along with, with the way that he preaches and gets his message across. Well, ma'am, let me ask you this Blessed question. Blessed are the peacemakers. Ma'am, let me ask you this question. In, in his statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul said, Am I crucified for you? Does Brian, was Brian crucified? Does he really have a church? Well, he preaches the Word of God. Okay, we're going to correct that statement now. You see, that's what we do on what we say. We're constantly helping you. The Bible says he doesn't have a church. He didn't die for anything. But no. actually, Blessed Hope is his church. Anything, Excuse me? But he is a, a spirit-filled preacher. How do you tell that? Because I sit in his service every Sunday. Sounds like you're wedded to him. No, I'm not. Well, is the sinner's prayer that he preaches in the Bible? Yes, it is. Where is it? I'll give you a thousand dollars tonight if you can if you can reference it. Well, he preaches the Bible. Well, how about he gives it to you? He's your preacher. He I can, preaches. I I can give that to you. Uh, go ahead and give it. Go ahead and give it. Go ahead and give it. All right. No, say I, I sit in his church. I listen to him. He he's he's the yeah. Give give him the answer. She couldn't give him the answer. She couldn't answer it. I see it, I listen to him, I believe, I like the way he preaches. You know why? You know why? Because you haven't checked out the Bible. You haven't checked out the Bible, and so whatever he says go, whatever the pastor says go, that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. Case in point, right here. Try to get through this right here. Does his current wife, is she acceptable of this? Is this um, a situation I think I heard somebody, he didn't really elaborate on that, surprisingly, huh? But I did hear somebody ask that, and he said she believes in what he preaches. And if you remember, she was only 15 when he took her as his wife, and I don't know how long yeah. that she had been going to his church with her parents. But I'm sure if, it's just like anything else, Deborah. if you start out at a very young age. Impressionable. And somebody keeps telling you this is right, telling you this is right, especially in the form of your pastor in the mm -hmm. church, then you think it's right, it's okay. Pastor said it's right, it's got to be all right. Never check it out, never looked at it, never examined it, right? <laughs> I love this, I'm at Jackie's church, Jackie's church, Jackie's rules. <laughs> I love this. I'm at Jackie's church. Jackie's church. Jackie's rules. I don't know if you hear that or not. Jackie's church. Jackie's rules. That's what she says. So you put these people in place. You you allow these people to have the the power over you because you won't be set free from the Bible. Here's an example. Here's from the the Hiscox Baptist Manual. Notice what it says. The pastor has the oversight and supervision of all the interests of the church and of all departments of its work in both spiritual and temporal. You give him the free reign. You give him the free reign. He should not needlessly interfere with the deacons or, or trustees or Christian education workers nor assume dictatorial authority over the others, but you put him in a spot and you know he's going to take it you know he's going to take him when he gets in that spot. It is his privilege and duty to hold a watchful supervision over all the work of the church and the, uh, pur and the purposes of Christ may be uh, served in every way possible. You, but you put him in a position where he's going to take that authority. There's, there's a guy in, in Eden that uh, I've only been told this. I'm still checking it out, so I won't call his name. But I know he's been in five different churches. He's come in as pastor, five different churches, 
spends the money, and then goes to another church. Well, you, you let him in. You let the wolf in the hen house. Don't be mad that the chickens are all gone. See that? So why are these so-called pastors in this position? Because you put them there. And the reason why you put them there is because you didn't check out the Bible. Friends, better be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. You just might get it. Friends, we're trying to get people to go back to the Bible so that they can know what God says and how God wants the church to operate. The Church of Christ, we stick right with the Bible. If you want to study with us or have a Bible study, we'd be glad to do that. Here's how you can reach me, 276-340-2653. I'm running out of time. So I'm going to give you this one last admonition, friends. Don't settle for something that's not in God's Word. Always make sure you're asking and get a word from the Lord. Have a good night.